Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Michael Valley, and uh, I teach philosophy and world religions at Scottsdale Community College in Scottsdale, Arizona. And I'm here on behalf of the Mythology Corner to have a conversation with Gothi Vincent Enlund, the chieftain of the Wanderer Kindred. Gothi Enlund is known for his unique way of practically expounding the ancient Ausatru faith for the Ausatru followers of today. Uh, his eclectic personality, and I can vouch for that personally, ranges from martial arts to graphic arts. He is of Swedish and Norse ancestry, originally from South Dakota. He now lives in Mesa, Arizona with his wife and his two wonderful daughters. It gives me great pleasure to speak with him today. Please join me in welcoming Gothi Enlin, and I hope you will enjoy our conversation. Uh, thanks for taking time to meet with us uh, today, Gothi Enlin. Uh, it's, it's my privilege, and uh, you just call me Vince. Okay, Vince, we'll do that. <laughs> I have uh, some questions that we've prepared for you. A lot of great questions. And we'll ask you these questions and we'll kind of uh, just go along with how it goes. Uh, we have a few general questions about yourself and this group that you run, the Wanderer Kindred. Uh, okay. Why and how did you come about to pick the Asatru path most generally speaking? Um, I chose the Ossetru path uh, when I was about 16. I was still in high school. Uh, through a whole series of events, I became very dismayed with the Christian church that I was a part of and with that whole social culture that I was part of at the time. Um, like most teenagers, I wasn't heavily involved with the church, but through a series of, of issues, I just felt abandoned by the church when my family needed it the most. Um, at that point in time, I went on kind of a quest to find where I felt I belonged. Um, I know a lot of people at that age go through, a lot of kids in high school, especially intelligent kids that do a lot of reading and stuff like that, which I did, I did a lot of reading. You know, they're always looking for where do I belong in the world, where am I going with my life, high school's starting to come to an end, what's my future going to be like. Uh, at least when I was in high school, that's what a lot of kids were. And um, so having gone through that, I decided I was going to do some soul searching and try to find out where I belonged. And uh, through a lot of research and a lot of time and effort, I came up with nothing. And so having been raised very traditionally, very traditional Swedish, Norwegian, um, Lutheran kind of family, I was very aware of my Viking ancestry and my Scandinavian ancestry and the pre-Christian folklore and traditions that came along with that. And um, so I simply made a decision that this is how my ancestors had, li ancestors had lived for 30,000 plus years before Christianity came along, and it worked perfectly fine, and there were no issues, so that's just what I was going to do. Um, and I made a self-profession to that uh, on my 16th birthday. Um, and Well, not on my birthday. It was on May 1st, 16th, so it would have been May Day. It would have been spring of uh, my 16th, when I was 16. And uh, from that point on, I, was, I found out a few, laters, the, a few years later that the movement was called Asatru. Um, and it had been going on worldwide since the late 60s. And uh, I was not alone in my desire to just live by the worldview and the traditions and the ideas that our ancestors had lived by. So you started up this group called the Wanderers Kindred. Uh, what led you to start that? Oh, the Wanderer Kindred, we started that um, when my wife and I had our first child. Um, when I met Danny, uh, we got together, we had our first child, and um, she was quite young, and soon after she was like one or two, my wife became Austria as well, and decided that this was how she was going to live and what she was going to do, and we wanted to have a place where our children could grow up and not feel isolated, not feel alone. I know a lot of people who find, especially in America, who choose to live by an alternative religious or spiritual path of any kind, or even a, a, an alternate cultural path, um, can sometimes feel ostracized. Um, I know kids who are Jewish, and I don't consider Jewish to be any type of extreme, you know, out-of-the-box kind of worldview, but I know Jewish children who sometimes feel ostracized in their community, and I, th we thought, my wife and I both talked, and we thought that just being solitary, our children may feel like there aren't any other Austria, that we're some kind of weirdos. And so we wanted to start a kindred, so that we had that type of community, family type bond with people outside of our actual family, so that as our children grew up, they understood that they were part of a larger community that they weren't isolated, that our beliefs were not some strange thing that nobody else believed in, 
but we were part of a much larger community and a, a much larger worldview and culture. So use this word uh, kindred. Uh, this kindred. This is a, this is obviously a, an organized group. Uh, how do you get, what what is a kindred? How do you get into it? Is it selective? Can you just pop into a kindred? What is a kindred exactly? <laughs> a kindred for us, anyways, uh, is like an extended family, and um, you don't have to be part of a kindred within Ostrich. There are many Ostrich people who choose to be solitary practitioners. Um, there are many, though, I would say a large portion of the Ossetru community chooses to practice from a tribalist point of view. So within that tribalist point of view, you want to be part of a tribe of some type, which is what a kindred ends up working out to be. A kindred is a, almost like an extended family. It is your small tribe. And it can be anywhere from, at least uh, according to organizations that I've worked with, where we put the standard at three adult practitioners working together, up into... I mean, I've known kindreds in the 30, 40 people range, although things start to break apart when you start getting that many people trying to come together all the time. Okay. Um, so a lot of people may compare it to almost like a ward in a church. Okay. It is a small group of people who practice regularly together, who worship regularly together, who do ceremony together. And so they would be a smaller tribe within the larger overall community. So you have a special kind of... Uh degree of loyalty to the people within oh, the I would say definitely. as opposed to maybe someone who's not. Yeah, you have a term called inner garth or the inner yard and your outer garth with your outer yard. Your kindred would definitely be your inner garth or your inner yard. These are the people closest to you. These are blood family, your closest friends that are almost like family. These are the people that you don't just practice and worship with. These are the people that you're going to call if you're going to the movies and you want to go hang out with somebody, those are the first person people you're thinking of that you call. Okay. Or uh, me and the family are going to watch uh, an eclipse out in the desert because, oh, there's a solar eclipse going. These are the first people we're thinking of. Would you like to come with us? We're going to have a picnic. We're going to do this. That's your, your inner guard or your so, inner yard. So this, this would be like a group of very close people who are about who... Uh, unlike our normal groups of close friends that we have, it's actually bound by something kind of higher than the group, and that's this kind of spiritual connection as well as a yeah. friend and support network. Yes. Okay. And so you had mentioned uh, individual practitioners and people who are in kindreds. Give, could you give a brief sense of kind of different kinds of Ostrup paths that you can practice today? Um, there's quite a few different paths within Ostrich that a lot of people follow. I think the two major ones break up to, and this is my interpretation, but this is what I like to tell people, is you have tribalists and you have non-tribalists. Within Ostrich, there are tribalists, people who believe that part of being Ostrich is being a part of a tribe, whether that's a larger, greater community or having a kindred of your own, but that to truly practice and understand the worldview and to be true and to be like our ancestors, we have to be part of a tribe. And then there are people who don't hold to that value, either by choice or by necessity. There are people who are solo practitioners and not tribalists, either because they don't think it's necessary at all to be part of a greater tribe, or because of the area that they happen to live in or part of the world, or maybe the, the family, their extended family that they have is kind of unaccepting or whatnot. They're required to practice on their own or by themselves. There's nothing wrong with either side per se. You know, both benefits and downfalls to both sides. They're just two different sides of things. And then within each idealism, whether they're solo practitioners or whether they're tribalists, then you have also different branches. You have um, people who believe that, you know, practicing Asatru and to truly be Asatru, for lack of a better word, um, you have to have some type of European ancestry. And I think that's probably a mainstay of most Asatru believers, that you should be of some type of you know, European ancestry if you're practicing Asatru. And then there's some people that don't believe that that's a requirement at all, that anybody anywhere in the world that wants to practice Asatru is welcome to practice Asatru. Um, and those type of people exist in both tribalism and uh, non-tribalism. And what do you call that movement that says a anybody could uh, join up, no matter what the ethnicity I don't call it anything myself. <laughs> is there, is there, is there, that a, there is a general a, term. Uh, generally, that's except called universalism. Okay. And uh, there is focused belief in universalist belief. Focused belief is generally the idea that you should have some type of European ancestry if you're going to practice Asa True. Okay. And universalist belief is the idea that you don't. It, it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't matter whatsoever. Okay. Um, I believe those two terms have been misused a lot. That's why I don't like to apply them necessarily. I like tribalist and non-tribalist. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's that's useful. And uh, what, what's your long-term goal with uh, Wanderers Kindred? What do you hope to accomplish with it? 
Well, I hope to accomplish that standing of showing both, giving both an opportunity for my family, what we originally started for, both my family and the families of the other members of the kindred, to grow up within a tribalist community and understand that they're not alone, that other people they can talk to about the about spiritual matters, about personal matters, they have an extended family, and that being Asa true is not some crazy, weird, hippie thing, that they're, they're perfectly normal people and their parents are perfectly normal, and we as parents and adults are perfectly normal and to believe that we want to believe and kind of be our own support group. Outside of that, my hope is to provide an example for how to build a strong kindred to other people that want to build one and help to provide resources for them that so they come out and say, look, we're trying to build a kindred of our own. You guys have been around for 15 plus years now. Um, how can we create that strong bond? How can we accomplish those same things? Now, you have, uh, you have held the official title of chieftain. Uh, what is it about, uh, what does a chief do and what is it about it that you enjoy the most? Wow, enjoy is a tough word. Well, we'll split off with uh, what it is. Um, within the Asatru community, there are, there's not a lot of leadership goals because we are not uh, like a religious organization the way the Catholic Church is. There is no Asa Pope. There is no head, although we do have certified clergy. And Asa True is a nationally recognized religion, both in the United States and many other countries around the world. So therefore we have clergy, recognized clergy by the federal government. Um, so the clergy are considered Gothi or Gothar. Um, and those are people who handle spiritual practice, um, ritualized uh, events such as bloat and sumble, uh, which we can go into detail about later. And uh, those would be the spiritual practices. Those are also the people that other people tend to go to when they're having a spiritual crisis or spiritual need or spiritual question is they go to the Gothar, uh, whether it be male as a Gothi or female as a Githia. As a chieftain, my position is the exact opposite. My position is not a spiritual focus. My position is a realistic focus. My position as chieftain of the, of the wanderer kindred is to A, see to the needs of the kindred from a physical and fiscal standpoint. Um, if we're going to do something that requires park space outdoors, it's my job to make sure that we have the proper requirements, that we're meeting legal needs, that all of the people that are participating within my kindred are participating in a safe environment, that kids are going to be safe, that everything's going to be handled. So it's an appropriate event. Um, and so if, if we need to purchase uh, a license to use event, then, okay, what do I need to do to get that license? Those are my kind of things. Um, outside of that point, my other need is, again, day-to-day -day life. When people have questions, uh, both me and my wife have acted as marriage counselors to both members of our kindred and to people from other kindreds even that know us and who talk to us. And so we spend a lot of back and forth. Uh, my wife being a Githya, she's part of the clergy, has spoken many times to people about uh, spiritual responsibility within a marriage or within your life or within a task you take on. And I'll spend time talking to them about the, the necessary requirements, the day-to-day -day requirements. You know, yes, your spiritual needs are important and it's important to address these, but on that same note, you have very realistic day-to-day -day requirements in being a husband or a wife or being responsible or being employed or whatever the, their dilemma may be. Um, so that tends to be my focus. My focus is on the real life day-to-day Keep the kindred running, okay. keep everybody happy, keep the peace, keep things moving forward. Okay. And now you, uh, you are actually a martial arts instructor and have been for many years. And you teach a discipline that you call Krieger and Vane. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what is Krieger and Vane? How does it relate to your, uh, to your faith uh, or your spirituality? The Krieger and Vey is uh, a system that we put together a few years back, I'd say about eight to nine years ago. And at the time, we were trying to create a, a system of martial arts based on traditional European fighting tactics, pre-Christian tribalistic fighting tactics. Fighting tactics, And we started out with Galima and Icelandic stuff and stuff we knew that the Vikings did. Um, so we thought we were doing something new and something great and coming up with this. I don't like to say that we created the Creeper Bay anymore because looking back on it now, what we did was we systemized things that all existed. Because as we expanded out of Iceland and outside of the Vikings and realized, you know, as we grew that, you know, um, our European ancestors were far more than just Vikings. And there's, Europe was a very broad country, and even the Vikings didn't all come from Scandinavia. They came from all over the European countryside. And so we started expanding into the other tribes and the other countries, and we realized that many of the techniques and, and 
fighting tactics that they used and stuff were written down, um, going back as far as the 11th century. And then, of course, we can trace stuff back earlier, much later than that. And going back and looking at Greek stuff, we can go back well into the BCE era and, and see stuff that they have documented, both through art and through writings and whatnot. And so as we started to put this together, we realized that not only had all of this stuff already existed at one point in time, but many other people are teaching it. Many of the historical fencing clubs and historical recreation clubs are teaching the same techniques that we were teaching. The one primary difference is, is we wanted to put together a system that was both very traditional in where it came from, from a European standpoint. We wanted something that was of European descent, that our ancestors did, that our ancestors used, that we knew worked and was functional. But we wanted to put it together in a manner that was usable in real life, modern day self-defense now. Now, not to say that I don't enjoy um, combat fencing, because I do, and I do it myself, and I actually think that other people should. But realistically, nobody's going to challenge me to a duel with uh, broadswords and shields, you know, out in a grocery store parking lot someplace, uh, or outside my house. Yeah, that's just not going to happen. Plus, yeah, I'm not going to walk around with a long sword and a shield and a hand axe anymore. It's, we're not Vikings, and it's not that time. But that doesn't mean I don't have to defend myself anymore. And so we were looking at it from how do we take these techniques that they use, that we can see they use, that are documented, and how can we not only use them today, but create a system so that those of us who were working on it, which it wasn't just me, there were several other people that were helping me do this, um, but those of us that were working on it could then teach other people and they could take the same things and they could start classes of their own, which means you need a system. You need a pattern that anybody can pick up and follow. Even though techniques might vary from person to person, and focus of that person may change. You know, maybe their focus is a little more on you know grappling and less on striking, and another person's focus is a little more on striking and less on grappling. Or another person likes to focus a little bit more on weapons because they tend to be more of a traditionalist or whatnot. They could still follow the same pattern of teaching, and they could still follow the same format, and without giving up their interpretation of the techniques. And, uh, and we ended up with the Krieger and Vey, which is still kind of a growing and morphing, changing kind of thing. When you, when you do Krieger and Vey, do you feel uh, that you're doing something spiritual, something transcendental? Transcendental, I would say. Not so much spiritual, but I do believe it connects me to my ancestors. And that's where its connection to Asatru is. Okay. is. It was something that, having been a martial arts my, martial artist for most of my life, uh, since I was 11 years old, um, the martial arts, and when people think of the martial arts in this country, everybody focuses on Asian martial arts. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have multiple black belt rankings in many Asian martial arts and enjoy them, still teach, I still practice. But my goal was to create something that was systemized that people could learn that was from our history and our culture and our past. Realistically, people tend to think of the samurai as this ultimate goal in a martial arts warrior. And the samurai was really only the top of his food chain in one country, in one part of the world, for a relatively short time period, actually, in comparison. Whereas pre-Christian European, the Germanic tribes, and, and I like to say Vikings for lack of a better word, but it was far much more than the Vikings. These were the ancient Germanic tribes as a whole, with a dominant combative military force on the face of the planet for two and a half millennia. Mm -hmm. They fought other countries, they were bodyguards for other world leaders, they, they cast themselves around the world and were considered the most predominant you know, warriors and soldiers that existed anywhere. Yeah. That couldn't have been just a happenstance. You don't exist for that long in that position unless you you work at it and you're good at it and there's some skill to it. I wanted to bring that to modern people of both Europe and of European tradition. Many people here in America are of European ancestry and I personally find it nice to know that I can practice a martial culture um, from a modern standpoint and know that this was stuff that my ancestors did. That was important to them and I think that creates a direct link for me to them. Uh yeah, so, so we got this modern movement we call it Oster. Can you just uh, briefly sketch just a little bit what some of the major developments in the, in the development of this modern movement are? Um, well, I would say some of the major developments, and uh, there's been a few. I would say the first would, of course, be um, in both spring and summer of 1972. Um, in spring of 1972 in the United States is when Asatru was officially recognized as a national religion. 
and the first 501c3 federal license was issued for an Ossetru group, and that would have been for the original um, Ossetru Free Assembly, uh, which was a movement from the Viking Brotherhood who became the Ossetru Free Assembly. Later that same year in the summer is when Ossetru became recognized in Iceland as a national religion. Oh, so, um, so we preceded them a little bit. Just a little bit. Well, I, I like to remind people, though, that although it, it, it's fun to say that we were the first ones to be recognized nationally as a, as a national religion, it's much harder to do in Iceland than it is in the United <laughs> States. So they started before us. I, I'm fairly certain they probably started before us. I don't actually know, but I do know um, Iceland is a socialist country, and uh, having your religion recognized nationally under, under Icelandic law means that the government is giving you money. Mm -hmm. And so it is a much more difficult process in right. Iceland to become okay. recognized as a national religion. Um, whereas in the United States, the federal government doesn't have to give us anything to be recognized as a religion. As a matter of fact, we pay them to recognize us as 501c3. And uh, so I'm sure that the process is a little more difficult up there. But yes, we actually did um, beat Iceland to the punch by a few months in 1972. But that began the, although the movement began much earlier than that, you could say that the movement began during World War II. Um, a, a big stomp was kind of put on it by the Nazi party, which drug it way down. Um, then in the early 60s, you start to see a rebirth of that going, both in England, in Iceland, and here in the United States. But the turn in 1972, what it did um, was with, especially with two countries, nationally recognizing it, and two not, you know, two first world countries. So these are countries with strong economies, with good financial standing, people recognize them, they know who they are and whatnot, you know, especially the United States, from a, a national media perspective. It gives some legitimacy to it, and it offers the opportunity for media, for press, for people to start reaching out. And that I think that is the biggest turning point you have. Because you have books being written before then, you have media being published before that time. But after 1972 is when you start to see this turnover. When you start to see people looking and go, oh, you're real. You didn't make this up. Now, we still could have, because technically in the United States you can make something up and be recognized as a national religion. But it's just that recognition that allows people to open their mind a little bit more. Now, this, this group, this uh, Austro Free Assembly, is that what we know today as Austro Folk Assembly? Yes. So that, that is, uh, that's what we see today. Can you give us just a, a, a really quick overview of some of the major groups that people might run into if they look into Austro? Well, if you look into Austro, there are several national religions inside the United States, and there are several national religious organizations for Austro within the United States, and then several outside of the United States. Uh, many of the Scandinavian, many of the European countries in general, have a national organization for also true now. Um, there's quite a lot out there. Within the U.S., though, you're, the primaries that you're going to find are the also true Alliance, the also true Folk Assembly, the Troth, and the Odenic Rite. Okay. Um, some of the smaller ones you may find are um, uh, the Irman Sewell. There's an organization called the Irman Sewell. Um, and there's an also true Hearth up north that is technically recognized as a national organization. Um, there is a uh, Heathen United Hearth, which uh, is again uh, north, I think they're almost Canadian actually, I think they're Canada and the U.S. Okay. Um, they're smaller, but again they are recognized nationally in both the U.S. and Canada actually. And so that makes for a, a situation. But yeah, the Austro Alliance, the AFA, the Austro Folk Assembly, the Troth, and the Odenic Rite are going to be the four big ones you'll find in the United States. And actually the AFA and the Odenic Rite and the Troth all have footprints outside of the United States as well, whereas the Austro Alliance is solely a U.S. Now, do you have any sense of uh, how many people are involved in this religion, maybe in the United States and perhaps worldwide, and why people are attracted to it? Um, Population-wise, like how many people are practicing Austro is a pretty hard number to come up with. A lot of Austro are, uh, again, non-tribalist, and um, they aren't necessarily openly talking about it or advertising it or whatnot, although outside of Europe they're much more open about it uh, here in the United States. But um, many countries outside of the United States have added Ossetru or heathenry to their census data in the last census that was in, uh, I think it was 2009 or 2010. Um, and so they have some numbers. Um, the United States, although hasn't added it to the census, uh, there are other ways that we have come up with certain numbers in the United States, um, including the military and the prison systems. 
which both recognize and provide material and whatnot. Uh, so I did a couple years ago uh, when the census, when the European census was released and that information was available, I put together some numbers and uh, based on world population and standard marketing mathematics, being a graphic designer and working for marketing, I use some pretty standard mathematics that are used when doing projection, sales projections based on populations and whatnot. And I can fairly, I can say with a fair degree of confidence that a very conservative number is well over six million worldwide. Okay. And I, I think that is a very conservative number. There are a lot of people that'll bark at me because I can't give an exact ratio to where that number came from. And, um, oh, and that's way too high and whatnot. But um, when you look at world populations and you look at the people that are coming out outside of the United States on censuses and saying, yes, I practice this. And then when you also look at the wide range of people that would fit into the Ossetru demographic, you know, per se, from tribalist to non-tribalist, universalist, folkish, um, people that are a little, maybe a little more neo-pagan, um, but are still practicing the majority of the Ossetru type beliefs and idealisms. Uh, worldwide, I think that number is very conservative. And that is just my opinion, though. I like to put that out. I'm not a census guy. When you talk to people who are attracted to the movement, do they give you any kind of a sense of, are you getting any sense of a trend of why people are showing interest in it? Oh, definitely. I think most people who end up coming to Asatru are because they're coming back to an ancestral root and a worldview, a cultural worldview that really was not that out of norm. Our grandparents held in very high standards the same values that we as Austria hold today. They taught the same worldview and they taught the same idealism. I tell people all the time that I was raised heathen and told it was Christian. So my grandparents were Christian. They were Lutheran and then converted to UCC, which was United Church of Christ, um, and brought us into it. But I was still raised by the same traditional lessons, stories, worldviews that they were raised by, who their grandparents were raised by. My grandpa used to tell me all the time, if we did something as a family that maybe our minister at the church didn't agree with, I would ask my grandpa about it. Well, why are we doing this when, uh, you know, Jim says that we're not supposed to be doing this? Wherever Jim says we're not supposed to be doing this. My grandpa's response was always the same. We do this because this is what my father did and what his father did and what his father before him did. So it's a and strong respect for tradition. That's right. That calls uh, some people to this faith. Yeah, well, that idea that we want to be who our ancestors were because they were more stable, especially now in today's economic time where worldwide there's all types of economic issues which cause people to question social issues. and they, It causes people to question life choices and what they're doing around them. And we look back at an older time where people were more stable because they were more self-reliant, they were more holding to their own and their own communities. They weren't looking to a bigger brother or a larger nation to take care of. So a strong sense of independence. And independence. Self-reliance. Yeah. Well, it's that worldview. Look back. How did they Where live did they and how could they keep those ideas and why can't I do that now? Good. And as soon as they find Asatru, they start to see, I can do that now. I can keep these old world views. I don't have to live like it's the ninth century. I don't have to pretend that I'm a Viking. <laughs> I can keep these world views and still live in today's time in the world. I can keep my job and I can be a better person for it. Now that brings up this question uh, that we had about us true kind of in a social sense and I think it might help to discuss one of the questions that I'm fascinated by and I think a lot of people watching this might be interested in is a lot of the people in Ossetru, they, they use this word heathen. Yes. And a lot of times we run into people who call themselves pagan, and we run into people who call themselves neo-pagan, and we hear people who call themselves Wiccans, and this kind of thing. There's all this stuff. It's very confusing for a lot of people. <laughs> How would you characterize, what, what is the kind of Ossetru vibe, and does it contrast with those other ones in any way? Or what I think similarities and differences there? Similar, similarities exist in the idea that... Uh, well, I'll kind of give you an umbrella principle that I do to a lot of people uh, so that they can understand it. Asatru is a part of heathenry. Heathenry is a part of paganism. Not all pagans are heathens. Not all heathens are Asatru. The similarities exist. Most heathens do share a lot of similar traits and ideals and practices and whatnot. But heathenry, in, ter in general, is any pre-Christian European tribalist practice. So although most of that is very similar to Asatru, Asatru is focused on the Germanic, pre-Christian Germanic tribal practices. Whereas heathenry in general can also include Roman, Greek, and Persian practices, which may have had many similarities at the time, but still would have had significant differences as well. So not all heathens 
fit into that Asatroid nihilism. And even heathens that practice Germanic tribalism, a lot of them don't necessarily like the term Asatru for whatever reason that they may have, and they prefer a more general term such as heathen. Paganism includes anything that is not Judaic, period. So, I mean, that includes Hinduism, and that includes Buddhism, that fit into this technical, you know, definition of paganism, um, because they're not Judaic. And so, obviously, we're not like that. Neo-paganism is a type of paganism that is non-traditional. So, traditional paganisms, for example, um, Indian practices, pre-Christian American Indian practices, would fall into paganism, but not specifically heathenry. Right. Now, that doesn't mean that we disrespect that. We actually have a lot in common with them when you look at their, tribalist, their tribalistic traditions, their worldviews, especially their views on ancestral veneration and their connection to nature, we share a lot of similar ideals with them. Okay. But they're still not a part of Asatru or heathenry. They would still qualify for paganism. Neo-paganism are people who choose to pick and choose from many different views. Most of those are pagan views. Some of them are still Christian views. Uh, many neo-pagans will pick certain aspects of Christianity and add that to their daily practices. So and they, they tend towards eclecticism. Yes, yeah, that's a very right. good. They're very eclectic. Where you, whereas uh, you, as uh, you have more of a traditional view, where you you say, "I would like to emphasize what my ancestors were doing and believing." Yeah. Uh, and there's less emphasis on this eclecticism, like I'm going to take a god from that country or maybe a yep. god from that culture. But you're saying, let's stick with the gods of this culture. Yes. A little bit more of that kind of a focus. focuses on a European, a Germanic European cultural worldview. Whereas neo-pagan is a pick-and-choose worldview. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. Some people think that I'm picking on them when I say that. I, if it makes you happy and it makes you a better person, then do that. I don't have any issues with somebody. But those are the differences between being a neo-pagan and being a heathen or being Asatru. Um, now, when you start fitting in Wicca into that, there's a lot of debate on the Wicca front. Is Wicca a pagan belief? Is Wicca a neo-pagan belief? I know some Wicca that, are, that would fit into the pagan belief. They have some very traceable, very traditional ideas. They're very structured, and they can, they can give you lists of where their ideals came from and whatnot. But then again, I know plenty of people who are part of Wicca and are part of covens and whatnot that are very much neo-pagan. They're practicing Egyptian practices, and they're practicing Norse practices, and they're bringing in voodoo into their practices and stuff like that. And so, you know, it is very eclectic and is very neo-pagan. Now, one of the things that I've noticed uh, in my personal experience is uh, the Ausatru movement, the heathens, people who use that kind of language, uh, I've noticed they tend to emphasize very strongly a warrior ethic. Uh, and this seems to be much more strongly emphasized with that group than, for example, amongst neo-pagans or Wiccans. Is, is, yes. Am I accurate? Am I all right, right what I've noticed there? I would say that you're accurate. There are a few people out there that do not like that term. They do not like being associated with a warrior cultural view or a warrior worldview. Okay. But I do believe... Really, heroic ethic? I would say definitely heroic like, would uh, be... I would have, for example, an obligation to be able to protect... Yes. You know, that I would be trained physically to be able to protect... I think a heroic prepared. ethic is the way to look at it. When you look at the hero archetype that we idealize here in the United States, it is very much Germanic hero. It is Beowulf. It is the old kings. It is the knight in shining armor. Even all the way down to the cowboy, which is a very American, but even when you look at the cowboy ethics, they are very traditional in their European history and where they came from. And so I would think, my definition, I would call, I would look at that as very much a, a hero ethic rather than a warrior ethic. There was a desire within our culture, um, ancient-wise, you know, when we look at pre-Christian Germanic tribalism, all people fought to protect their land and their family and their possessions because our tribes in general lived in some of the harshest parts of the world without single kings uh, through most of history. These were small farmsteads and towns that became strong on their own backs and on their own blood and on their own sweat and on their own work. And so I think that they held very strongly to that. I also think that you could say that that heroic culture does exist and existed then and is carried into today based on ideas. Even when you look back historically and you look at countries like Rome, when Rome decided to try to cross the Rhine, Rome was held back from crossing the Rhine by the Germanic tribes. Rome was organized and had one of the largest armies in the face of the planet, largest paid armies. So these were paid professional soldiers. The Germanic tribes were not. These were farmers and woodworkers and ranchers that all came together and three attempts and Rome was never able to cross the Rhine and so they just stopped trying from a military aspect and took a uh, social economical aspect and traded their way across into the Germanic tribes. Um, 
But from that, you understand that to do that, people had to have had that heroic ethic. And I like the term heroic ethic because when you look back at the old stories, the emphasis was not on soldiering. The emphasis was on heroics. Do glorious things and be remembered. And you can see that that, that archetype carried throughout history from our ancient BCE Germanic tribes all the way into post-Christian Iceland, well into the 14th century. And then now you really see it even today when we look at that. How many people don't know the story of Beowulf? How many people haven't picked up a comic book and know who Thor is? That Germanic hero archetype has existed and exists worldwide, is both recognized and revered worldwide. And so I think that's what, that heroic ethic is what most Ossetra want to maintain in their life. Okay. And I think that separates us greatly from the rest of the pagan community. Now, um, a few more questions about kind of the social political issues. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, a lot of times the universities and so on, they, they teach Greek and, and Roman, and also Greek and Roman mythology and so on. Would you like to see the schools emphasize a Norse uh, tradition uh, more? Is this anything that you think would be good for the culture? I think it would be. Um, when you look at English colleges, Oxford, so schools like that, and you go to Europe in general, not just English, but I mean you can look at uh, universities in Scotland and Denmark and Norway and Iceland and Sweden, um, but well into England and Finland and even into the Slavic countries, there are, both at a high school and a college, higher education level, um, a big emphasis on uh, understanding Norse and Germanic culture and history. Whereas in the United States, we've kind of walked away from that, both at, a, both at a high school and at a college level. So yeah, it would be great. Um, being that this is the United States, and it is such a multicultural country, and it's one of the few countries in the world that I think is truly multicultural in their wanting to accept all cultures and be accepting of it, I think that it would be beneficial for a lot of colleges to develop um, a system of cultural courses where people could explore more into whatever their personal cultural choices were, whether it was what they were born, the culture they were born in, or another culture that they were just intrigued with. Um, and I think that, and this is just my opinion, I think that a good college professor could teach a world cultural course and look over his students and say, you know, this semester I can see my students, these are the cultures we're going to focus on. This is the history and the mythology that we're going to focus on for this class and give a good coverage. Um, but yeah, from a very biased and personal aspect, I would love to see our colleges add a Germanic mythology and uh, Norse uh, culture course to uh, uh, American colleges. I think it would be great. Now tell me a little bit about uh, chaplains. Uh, do, you, do you have chaplains? Do you do chaplain work? Uh, and uh, how and where do you do it? Um, yeah, I don't personally. But many of the national organizations, actually I can say all of the national organizations, the big four anyways that I named earlier, uh, the Austro Alliance, the Austro Folk Assembly, the Troth, and the Odenic Rite all have chaplain services okay. that expand both into the military and into the prison systems. Okay. Um, the primary groups doing outreach in the prison systems is the Austro Alliance and the Odenic Rite. But the Troth and the AFA also have people there. It's just on a smaller scale and depends the state that you're in and whatnot. Um, within the military, a large portion of the military chaplain services that are out there um, are out of the Austro Alliance, although again, the AFA has a good standing within the military as well, and the OR has a little bit. Um, there is not a huge amount of chaplains available. Um, as of right now, uh, one of the primary issues within the prison systems is a lot of state prisons do not want to pay Ossetru chaplains like they pay Christian chaplains. And um, many of the national organizations, including ones I've worked with in the past, um, just if you're not going to pay us, you you got to make a stand. If they're doing it for free, we'll do it for free. And that's been one thing we've done. We've gone into prisons where all of the chaplains volunteered. Okay, then we'll volunteer too. But then we've gone into prisons where all of the chaplains were paid, but they wanted us to do volunteer. No, you pay all the chaplains. We're federally recognized, you have to pay us as a chaplain. And this usually only comes in in state prisons. Federal prisons recognize Austro Alliance, and they pay us like any other chaplain. The federal system has a chaplain rate. This is what chaplains get paid. And at the federal colleges, we have chap or federal prisons, we have chaplains, just like anybody else has chaplains. Now, you had mentioned the military. Do you have uh, 
does the military offer a specifically Alice true kind of recognition to a fallen soldier? Or? They do to fallen soldiers now. This is one of the things that, um, through a national effort, and, and I will say this, I was part of it, but so were many other people and uh, many of the national organizations. Um, there were quite a lot of us that were both spe that were all spearheading this and pushing it out to the community. But this was totally a community, a national and even international to a point community effort to get the national military service to recognize Ostrich to the point that when a soldier dies, he can now have a Thor's hammer or Mjolnir placed on his gravestone, even in Arlington Cemetery. Was and there is now one gravestone in Arlington with a hammer on it. Am I correct? Was was this project called uh, the Quest for the Hammer? Yes, yes I, I believe that was the the AFA's title for it. Okay. And so there was obviously success there. Yes. And there has been success there. At, at the cost of at least one good soldier, if not more. Okay. Um, that is what the military ended up working out was when it came down to the final uh, marker, the military came back and said, you know, we had turned in paperwork, we'd done the whole process, and they said, okay, well, at this point in time, for this to go on the list under new rules, somebody has to die and his family has to request it on his tombstone and then that becomes the marker and it becomes added to the list and within a year of the military making that proposal a young gentleman died overseas um, and his family did actually make the stand and say that our son was also true and he wanted a hammer on his tombstone and a hammer was placed on his tombstone. Wow. Um, how does, uh, we're almost ready to get into the worldview stuff, but <laughs> Uh, well, how would you characterize Austria's relationship with uh, other religions, anything from religions that are more similar to you to all the way out to monotheistic religions? I think in general good. I mean, obviously, when you, when you think about relationships like that, it's going to vary very much with the person that you're talking to. Some people are very angry. Some people are not very angry. And obviously, any personal, any individual's personality is going to very much come across in how they interact with other people. But as a general rule, um, also true's inner people who are also true, their interaction with other faith it is fairly normal. We don't, we are not universalist in the idea of the scholastic term of it. In, in the idea that Christians call themselves universalists, Christians believe that Christianity is the one true faith. Right, the word universalism has many different names. Depending yeah, on how yeah, depending on how. So, yeah, when Christianity thinks of universalism, they believe that they are the one universal belief. We don't believe that. We believe that our gods are our gods for our people there to help us and those of us that worship them. And that other people have other gods and other cultures have other gods that are looking out for them. And that there is a large span, you know, outside of the world that we live in now, you know, this life that we live in now. There are a large span of gods for different peoples and different cultures and different places. So most Asatru tend to be very open when talking to other people. We're not trying to force people to be Asatru. We have no desire to convert the world to be like Vikings, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, the Vikings didn't either. Uh, although the Vikings were great conquerors, their conquering and their pillaging was primarily for economic gain and trade routes. Um, the religious conversion was never really a big issue with them. Um, and it's not for us today. So it allows for us to be very open when other people, you know, come to us or are talking to us, or even to the point where I know plenty of Asatru people who are married to people of other religious faiths and have them for a long time, and it really doesn't interfere with their marriage. Because our goal is not to convert anybody. Um, I do a lot of personal outreach for Asatru myself. Uh, you know, because I speak at the college, um, and I speak at other colleges, and I lecture and whatnot. I always tell people my goal isn't to convince anybody that they should be Asatru. My goal is simply to educate people so that they understand what Asatru is and that there can be an easier communication between Asatru people and people who are not Asatru without any type of fear because, well, we don't understand what it is, so we're going to assume you're a bunch of crazy people dancing around naked on a full moon. That's not how it works. <laughs> we want people to understand that we're doctors and lawyers and garbage men and car mechanics and graphic designers and uh, hopefully some professors, <laughs> and uh, and we get to the point where people we're just people, we're hardworking, normal people like everybody else. Well, you had a, you had a nice segue when you had mentioned this idea that uh, there are different gods for different people. This is a really nice segue into the kind of big picture worldview stuff. Uh, also, true has a lot of cultural aspects, social aspects, community aspects, uh, and but one of the most fascinating things about this is is worldview. 
you know, that's a picture of the world and how it works. Uh, so let's get into that a little bit. Um, what would you say are some general significant ideas about worldview that most also true are would, would agree about? Uh, the nature of the world, uh, the natural, the supernatural, just some basic ideas that they might tend so to... So I can put together a few ideas. One I like to put together whenever I'm talking about also true worldview in general. Because obviously, because we are a traditional tribalistic people, different regions and different local areas and different kindreds, the details of their worldview are obviously going to be different from others. But some general ideas we can keep that, uh, that I, I like to bring up when I lecture and whatnot is, Asatru is a world-accepting pre-Christian European folkway in which we better ourselves through a web of right relationships among region, folk, and soil. Um, that we maintain with our inner garth or our inner yards by gifting relationships through which luck can flow between people and we can build a better and stronger standing for ourselves within our personal communities. We see the world in the here and now as world accepting. We're not trying to change it and make it into something else. We do not focus on an ultimate union with our gods, um, but in what is tangible and directly and directed directly related to us such as ancestor veneration and building and maintaining relationships with the spirits of the land. We see the world in the present and past tense in a clan or tribal-like model. And that is a very academic type statement, but for a lot of people um, that like to pick apart and whatnot, that is a good thing that most Austro have agreed on. I, I put it out there on blogs before and tests and, and ran across lots of different people from tribalist to non-tribalist and universalist and folkish, and a lot of those standings pretty much everybody can kind of agree on. Um, so when it comes to those kind of things and we talk about expanding on that into ideas of uh, like the supernatural and how the world is and, and does and will be kind of a thing, we can say, you know, most also true believe in the gods as true entities. Now, not all. There, there are some people who call themselves also true um, who do not believe that the gods are true entities. Most of those people actually refer to themselves as heathen. They, they won't use the term also true. Um, and they view the gods as a cultural aspect, not as a real thing. They can make up the minority. I can, I can say this with a very high degree of confidence, that most also true do view the gods as entities, as beings, as true beings that are out there with, that we don't necessarily with, understand. With a consciousness. With a consciousness and an understanding. And, and, yeah. and who can act. And yep. do, who, they make decisions okay. and can force change should they choose to okay. and whatnot. Um, most also true do believe in the supernatural and, and in magic, but I like to say that not the Harry Potter, Wicca, spell kind of magic that most people think of when they think of terms like supernatural and, and magic but more in the aspect that we believe that there are things that happen between us and our ancestors and the gods that we don't necessarily understand now. Austria has a very strong belief in science, um, obviously because we are a, a revivalist religion. We are taking historical and archaeological data that we are constantly getting new information on and we're adding it to our regular practices and to our understanding of who our ancestors were. So we have to be accepting of, of science to a degree. Plus. We know the scientific achievements of our ancestors, so we understand that our people were a scientific people in general. Do most of the Alsa True members, do they believe that these gods, who, who, in whom most of them believe as real entities, uh, do they believe that we can communicate with the gods, and do they believe that the gods can sometimes intervene directly into our lives, or are the gods more aloof in doing their own thing? Or is there different views on that? There's different views on that, actually. Um, I think, again, most Ashtra believe that the gods are real and that they can intercede. But okay. the, the primary difference in beliefs is some people, and we all believe that we can communicate with the gods. Okay. The gods don't necessarily communicate back. This is where you start to get into this line of, of different ideas. There is the one side that chooses to believe that there is an open form of communication. That not only can we communicate to the gods and give to the gods and share with the gods, but that on a very real and tangible level, the gods are also talking and communicating with them and will regularly intercede in their life for that person's benefit. Okay. And then you have other people that have a, a more traditional understanding of the worldview and a more traditional belief in the idea that the gods are there for the bigger picture. Yes, the gods can hear us and we make offerings so that they're happy with us and they can offer and they offer us better luck when they're happy with us. Mm -hmm. But most of their attention is focused on much larger things 
the universe and the world and nature, and even stuff that's very close to us. Some gods are focused on things closer to us, um, you know, like the grass and the plants and the harvest and and the hunt, the the animals that we eat. And but those, but that's still a big picture focus. Okay. Um, and so they're not necessarily interceding in our lives that often. Very very seldom. Only on very rare occasions should it truly be necessary. And the way they intercede is just by giving us better luck. Okay. Or through our ancestors. And that would be the primary reason why the focus on us is ancestral veneration. Because our ancestors are our direct link between us and the gods. Our ancestors are watching over us all the time. They're the ones that can intercede in our lives on a regular basis. And so what we hope to do is to communicate to the gods through them and to seek to seek better judgment from them. We want our ancestors to be happy with us and to like us because they're going to share that with the gods. So they're the ones with whom we are in the closest contact would be the ancestors. Yes. The gods, maybe, maybe not, they're a little bit further away. They're, they're dealing with very large-scale issues. Yeah. Uh, they, they're not the ones to whom you go first when yeah. you have issues. You talk to your ancestors first. Yes. And now those two people, some people do believe you go to the gods first. Okay. Um, and I would so say that the there is diversity in the movement, and I would say it's about half and half. Okay. Um, and fortunately, the good thing is it's not a hardcore, there's not a conflict between those two halves. Okay. Um, most of the people who choose to practice more ancestor veneration, which that's a growing number, that is definitely where, now that we know this and we can look back historically and archaeologically and we can see that that was a primary focus, more and more Ostro are moving in the heavy ancestor veneration um, every year you see that happening more and more often. But there's not a lot of conflict. People who choose to focus more on ancestral veneration aren't overly angry and yelling or anything if people who choose not to. And the people whose focus is more on it's not an especially God, It's not an especially contentious no. and uh, divisive issue. Most of the people are pretty accepting of both sides. Okay. So. so now, in my study of this religion, uh, in philosophy we have this uh, word, the word is ontology, and the word ontology means the study of what exists and what's real. I'm going to try to give a, a brief sketch of what I've learned, and you tell me if I've, if I've got this and if you add anything you like. So the idea is, okay, we've got, we've got a material world, uh, and we've got material human beings, and we live on this planet, and, and uh, there's uh, the philosophical materialists would certainly agree with all of this so far. But in addition to this, what Al True would generally say is, there is no uh, perfect being, okay, as in a traditional God who's omnipotent, omnibenevolent, and omniscient, all-knowing, all-good, and all all uh, powerful, but there are finite gods in the sense, what I mean by finite is you have a number of gods, all of whom are persons or have a will and can do things, but none of them is, is absolutely perfect, right? They, uh, they might be very powerful, might be very knowledgeable, but there isn't one who is all powerful, all good, and all knowing, kind of like a traditional theistic yeah. view. So you have, you have the lack of this kind of perfect God that a Christian might affirm or a Muslim, or a Jew, or even a Hindu, most Hindus would affirm that. But you do have a number of uh, deities, gods, goddesses. We can't forget the goddesses, yes. which is important for the religion as well. Then you also have in existence uh, a wide variety of other kinds of beings, including ancestors who are real, and who are aware of what we're doing, but they are not with us physically here. So they're part of the ontology as well. Yeah. And they're in some sort of a state that would be not physically on the earth, but somehow connected to it. Maybe perhaps some sort of a spiritual state or something like yeah. that. Maybe right. So the Asatru religion would it re recognize the ex existence of matter, perhaps soul, yes, uh, gods and goddesses, uh, ancestors who still exist, but does not recognize the existence of this perfect uh, being. Yes, I would say it's pretty true. Yeah, we don't we don't see any type of god as a perfect god. We don't believe in that one true, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-omniscient, completely perfect, unified God. Wait. So this brings up the question, um, the gods and goddesses, uh, have they always existed and will always exist? Or did they come into existence and they will go out of existence? Um, and that's a debatable topic, depending on who you talk to within Austria. Again, we don't get a whole lot of Austria philosophers going deep into this kind of stuff. But uh, it is something they've talked about once in a while. And um, when you look at the lore, and you look at what people are generally believe, I would say that, no, they have not always existed. They came into creation. We have a belief called the well, um, of which all things sprang forth from. And the gods came from the well. And I believe, I personally believe, in judging from the lore, that they came out of need. There was a need 
2% order, therefore the well created something that would, and that something eventually became the gods. Because the original creation, if you look at the story of creation, which is just a story, we don't believe it to be fact, but it didn't start with the god. The well didn't create a god. No, the well created water, which brought life to a certain area, which created growth. That growth brought something else to the area to see what the growth was, and that intermingling between new life and growth created gods. Okay. Gods then saw what was there and decided that it needed to be built and protected. Well, this, this, this is some really fascinating stuff. Uh, so, so we have this idea of, of uh, this ultimate principle of a well giving birth to everything. Yes. Uh, and so now this gets us to a question that we, we were working on here is the us true religion, as well as a lot of European uh, history, talks about a special kind of a tree that's called Yggdrasil. So what is Yggdrasil and how does the well relate to Yggdrasil? So Yggdrasil is the world tree. Yggdrasil is the tree that we believe connects all of the nine worlds that we believe in. And the nine worlds would be different worlds of gods and other immortal beings such as dwarves and elves, um, the underworld, uh, dark elves, uh, Niflheim and Muspelheim, which are uh, Helheim's halls, and those are different places where the dead go, um, as well as Asgard and uh, Iflheim and, and whatnot, which are places where some of the gods live and, and, and whatnot. And so I can't name all nine worlds off the top of my head because... Most of the words I can't even pronounce because, you know, my, my old Norwegian is just terrible. Um, but the tree is what connects all those worlds to each other. The tree gets all of its life from the well. And that's one of those things that once the well sprung forth, um, and the well was created when, uh, from chaos, basically. So you have a world that was frozen. You have ice and nothing, and you have fire and nothing. And then where that collision happens and chaos comes from that, so came spring, and from that spring was the well, and from that well there became growth, and, and one part of the growth it was better than other parts. Some part, oh, you go further over here, it's still frozen, and you go further over here, and it's still fire. But in the middle, you have this place where life can flourish. And this gives you a real insight into our ancestors' view of how they saw the world around them, between places where we could grow things, and we could live and be prosperous, and go too far up north, and you're going to freeze to death and die. And, uh, you know, that kind of idealism. And uh, the tree comes from that well. And all things are connected to the tree. And the tree connects all things. And so this becomes this prominent idea that within nature, from a balance, you don't have to have an all-powerful one being. You have to have a balance, which is what the gods, in, in the old story, that's what the gods even come to. Kind of, at one point in time, there's a war between the old gods. And the gods realized that all that war was doing was destroying everything. And that only in finding some type of balance and keeping an order and a balance to things would things continue to grow and prosper and be positive. And this is where you start to see that idealism of you don't need a perfect god. You need, like in nature, you need multiple gods to keep things in balance. One type of tree will not make the world green. We can't plant the same exact apple tree everywhere in the world and make the world a better place. I mean, they can't even be apple trees, for crying out loud, and there's more than 265 breeds of apple trees. And you couldn't plant apple trees worldwide and make the world good. You need lots of trees. And then within each type of trees, you need lots of different families of trees. And then you have roses, and you need, there's like 126 kinds of roses out there. And flies, for crying out loud, which flies drive me crazy, but I think there's over 75 different types of flies. So the, so the polytheism of, of the religion, uh, in contrast with, for example, the monotheism, uh, the, the uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and also Hinduism and many... Uh, uh, Hinduism, of course, very diverse, but most Hindus yeah. I talk to will call themselves monotheists. So uh, also true is going to be kind of emphasizing this plurality. Uh, yes. Plurality seems ultimate to oh, yeah. Hard polytheism. So the heathen mind and hard polytheism being yeah. the view that the gods are individuals. They are not to be smushed into each other. Yeah. They're not just facets of one being in the middle. They are, each one has its own, his or her own distinct identity. Yeah. And it's viewed as somewhat, perhaps even, could it be fair to say, disrespectful to treat a god or a goddess as being something that he or she isn't. Oh, I would definitely. I, I would definitely agree that. I think many of us believe that treating a god or a goddess as something that they aren't 
um, is very disrespectful. And uh, I have actually seen it happen before. Again, most Austria, like myself, try to be very understanding of other people's idealisms. But uh, you get a lot of intermingling between uh, heathen community, the Austrian heathen community, and the neo-pagan community. And that's where you start to see people who will do things like compare Freya to an Egyptian goddess. Mm. That's insulting to most Austria, true. Because we so. believe that they are not the same god. We believe right. that the pre-Christian Egyptian tribalist beliefs are real. And those gods were there for the Egyptians, to help the Egyptians, and are still there for the Egyptians, because the Egyptians are still a people. Okay, so so this... to make that comparison and call them the same god is not only insulting to us, it's insulting to Egyptians. Okay, then this is uh, very interesting, the idea that, okay, so you have a lot of gods, uh, and your, uh, the also true gods have certain names that are famous uh, to us, but uh, the Hindus, for instance, they have gods as well, and the Romans and the Greeks have gods and so on. And so a lot of people have this idea, well, they're just all just different names for the same beings, yeah. or maybe they're all just different names for just one being. So, the, so Austria tends to take the view that you've got a lot of gods, and guess what? They are actually a lot of gods. Yes. And, and, and uh, Freya is Freya, and Isis is Isis. Yes. Okay? And uh, Saraswati is Saraswati, and that's it. And to respect these goddesses, for instance, is to respect them each as an individual. Yes. And not to merge them all into this, this mass. Yeah, and which is so very you much recognize the existence of other deities and other cultures. Oh, very much. And yes. say those deities are the deities who are, come, who are uh, related to you. And so you, sh you, yes. you ought to honor your deities. Yes. And, and my, I, watch, I honor my deities, you and you honor yours, and there's nothing in any kind of disrespect about that. Yes, no, there's not. That's, it's, that's how it should be. And I think it happens mostly here in America, I think, where you see that happening. And I think it's that idea that, that Americans have that we all have to be so accepting to the point that we all believe in everything. And I don't think we have to. I think, <laughs> I think true peace comes from understanding individuality and supporting it. I don't have to make somebody who's Hindu believe in my beliefs. I simply want them to respect my beliefs, and I'll respect their beliefs, yeah, and, because and we they, can get along great. And, and, and because you actually do believe that his gods yeah, are, his, are yeah. real. I have no doubt that his gods are real, yeah. and are his gods are the, and I have no desire to be disrespectful to that whatsoever. Even though I may not understand Hinduism as a worldview, or even in its details, and how he practices, and how he lives it, I do believe that those gods are his gods and that they're real gods, and that if I'm going to respect him as a person, I need to respect the fact that those are his gods and not my gods. They're his gods. I yeah. have my own gods. Now, here, here's where the fun question comes Okay. Up. Okay, so, so you can talk to the Hindus, you know, you can talk to the people who are worshiping the Egyptian gods, and then you run into a Christian and a Muslim guy. Okay. And they talk about God, and they talk about Allah or whatever, and they say that, your gods don't exist at all, at best. At best. And at worst, perhaps, they're <laughs> demonic forces. Yes. They may have that view as well. And so you're talking about, you know, they're the god who, who they are recognizing as the only god. So the question is, according to your worldview, is their god real? Or are they actually worshipping one of the finite gods that you recognize, but mistaking him or her for a perfect being? Or is this being just doesn't exist at all? Or what's going on with those so, religions in your picture? <laughs> and I'll go with from my your picture. Um, I have talked to a lot of people about this, and you're going to get a lot of varying ideas and whatnot. Um, but a lot of people come to a very similar conclusion. I will say there are a lot of people who openly agree with me. But I will give you my personal opinion, and okay. this is my belief, that happens to be shared by certain other members or not. This is officially his own personal opinion. This is officially my own personal opinion. <laughs> Um, uh, within the Austria community, for any Austria people who watch this, this is my UPG. We'll put that out there. And uh, um, unverified personal gnosis. Yes. <laughs> um, a lot of Austria do not believe that the Judaic gods, other than Judaism, are real. We do not believe in the Christian God. Uh, we do not believe in the Islamic God. Okay. Um, we are, though, uh, especially here in the United States, and, and but also across Europe, very understanding. You, so you would say that the, the God whom the Jew... The I Jewish would say I'm not interested in talking is, to you. <laughs> the, uh, you would say the Jewish God is, is the God for you. Yes, I would... Ex no, I would simply accept that they have an opinion and that they have the freedom anywhere in this world to believe what they choose to believe as long as they don't try to force me to believe it. they are welcome to their beliefs. On a personal level... 
if I'm going to truly call myself Asatru, and I'm going to believe in my gods as my gods, and I'm going to believe that other cultures have their gods, and those gods are their gods, and that these are real entities, which, by the way, this is my belief. I believe these things truly and wholly. Okay. Then there is no way that I can, in, in any facet, believe in the Christian God. Okay. Because to even accept, to even come out and say that, yes, your Christian God is your God there for you, is to justify his verification that his God is the one true God, because that's what he believes his God is. Okay, now, now I'm going to ask this one question. So, for example, if, if you were to recognize that the Jews are in, um, in a kind of special relationship with a particular God. Yes. Uh, now, if, if the Jew claims to you that this God who they've been worshipping for for thousands of years, is a perfect being, is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent, eternal, uncreated, never will die, necessarily existing, um, would you say, uh, well, I appreciate your views of him, I do believe you're worshipping God, I just don't think he possesses those characteristics. Is that that would be my point of view, yes. Okay, so, so you're worshipping God much like we are, but you are under the mistaken impression that that God is perfect. Yeah, I that supreme over all uh, yeah. others, but he's not actually. But he's not. I that is okay. your belief because when you look at Judaism, most Asatru recognize any cultural belief as a true belief. That's why we look at Judaism as the only true Judaic belief because they are a cultural belief. But when you look at the roots of Judaism, they didn't always believe that their God was the one and true only God and was completely and totally perfect, and that has developed because that cultural need has developed. We can respect it. And, and I can say that I do believe you are worshipping your God, and he is your God, and he is a true God for your people, and he is there for your people, and I can leave it at that because I don't want to disrespect somebody, uh, maybe that is a friend of mine, or even somebody that I've just met, hospitality being something that is of great importance to most of us, true? I, I wouldn't want to offend him. But on a personal level, no, I would believe that he is mistaken on that one part. I would believe that he is mistaken great, great. with the idea that... Great, we're doing religious metaphysics. I love this stuff. This is I, mean. <laughs> I love this stuff. I, but I wouldn't throw it in his face. <laughs> right. Keep but it to you, myself. Hey, there's nothing wrong with having an opinion about truth. That's right. You know, um, you got to have opinions of, of stuff. I mean, you just <laughs> have to. You can't have opinions about stuff, <laughs> otherwise you're just not doing much. Uh, I got this question. So when you were talking about the Yggdrasil, um, the audience, you know, might be a little unclear. You had mentioned a tree. You had mentioned the land of the dwarves and the land of dark elves and so on. Um, so someone watching might say. Did I did I hear dwarves in my house? Did I hear a tree? I mean, do you believe that there's a tree? I mean, can I cut this tree down? I mean, can someone cut this tree down? Are there elves and dark elves and dwarves? Uh, am I, are, is this Lord of the Rings? You know, I mean, what, how how does an how does a true person understand these concepts of like dwarf and elf and this kind of All thing? Right. I mean, are these well, like beings? I mean, what are, what are these things? Well, well, they are beings uh, in a sense. Um, it is very related to Lord of the Rings and the point because Darrow Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings and much of the lore and legend and things he wrote about came from pre-Christian Germanic tribalism. Okay. A lot of the ideas that he wrote about and things like dwarves and elves. Dwarves and elves and whatnot, these are all um, part of the Hood folk, or the hidden people, they're land whites, okay. or vetter, okay. the land vetter. The land whites. Uh, the land whites. And there are different kinds, Spirits and they go under different, different names depending on the parts of Europe where they may have originated. Now we can look back at all of history and see the big picture, and so we can recognize different things such as gnomes, hobgoblins, fairies, elves, dwarves, trolls, orcs, giants, jotuns, um, all of these mythological creatures, uh, werewolves. Uh, the Nordic culture has some of the oldest legends of werewolves and vampires and zombies. And trust me, man, you want to talk about me, you think modern-day zombies, vampires, and werewolves are nasty. Trust me, you look at the original writings from the Vikings and what they believed a, vi a vampire or a werewolf or a zombie was. And the only way to kill a Viking zombie was to drag it back to the grave it was originally came from and rebury it. And then it didn't kill it, you just managed to stop it from eating you. But uh, <laughs> so, um, so you would understand these words like dwarf and elf and orc and so on. Uh, as th th these are fanciful conceptions, but but we, but that you do believe that there are spirits that inhabit the land. Yes, we believe that the land has a spirit, and that that spirit is somehow connected to us. Yeah. Um, not so much in what modern day kind of hippie-ish thing, you know, we're not out praying to trees or anything like that, <laughs> but we do believe we have a connection to the land okay. 
that, that it is directly connected to us. And we get that from our ancestors' view because so much of their life was connected to the land, both in growth and in foraging and in hunting, that when you look back at these things of where did they came from and why did they believe in, the, in, in these types of the hidden people, why did they believe in things like the land whites and whatnot, and um, you look at, say, a town in Sweden south of a mountain, and when the winters came and the storms rolled in and the thunder rolled, and uh, you hear the mountain crash and the snow fall, you see a storm giant. You see an ice giant coming from the mountain to destroy your village. So you make offerings in hopes that it won't come that far. Now the question is, was that pure superstition or is there really something in... Are there really, truly spirits in nature? I, mean, I think there are. Or conscious, sir. I think you get into a lot of debate. Some people will say that it was superstition. It was how they interpreted the, the nature around them in a manner without the terminology we have now. You know, so they used terminology that we now call superstition that for them was just how they described that thing. For all we know, our ancestors may not have actually believed a frost giant was a giant that would come stomping through their village. They may have just recognized the storm front that was hitting the mountain and that avalanche that could come down and destroy them as a frost, as Jotun rolls, you know, the giant's rage. Okay. And so we're making an offering to help stop the giant's rage. They may not have thought it was an actual giant, but they may have. Yeah. And so it's something that I think there's a lot of debate. Either way, I do believe our ancestors believed that there were spirits in the land. Good. I believe that there are spirits in the land, and I believe most also truly believe that as well. Okay. Um, but maybe not in the physical sense we think of when we think of the Lord of the Rings and what a giant is and what a dwarf is and whatnot. Okay. Maybe not in that sense of the term. <laughs> okay. Now, we have a great question for you. Okay. Um, what, uh, from the perspective of Asatru, uh, what are we before we're born and what are we after we die? What's, what's that all about? Now, that's, that's a good question, and that's one of those very modern questions that, that people want to address now um, that our ancestors didn't address very much. Uh, they lived hard lives, and, and their, their lives were spent working you know, to the grave. And so although they did believe in an afterlife, not a lot was written about it. Um, we were one of the few cultures, uh, pre-Christian Germanic tribalism was one of the few cultures that did not have professional philosophers. Although we did have scribes and philosophers and poets and whatnot, um, they weren't, that's not what they solely did. They all had other jobs that they had to do for a full time. Mm -hmm. So you don't have these really deep, long information for us to look back historically and try to get a true grip of their worldview of where did we come from before we were born and where do we go after we die. Where do we come from from before we were born? You know, that's a good question. I'm going to go with science on that one and uh, just fall back completely do, do on that. Think, uh, do you think uh, the gods uh, play a role in creating souls? or I, I do uh, believe we have souls. souls. I believe that the gods play less of a role than other people may think. I think the idea from um, an Ossetry standpoint, or even a general heathen, European heathen standpoint, that the gods play a large role in where a soul comes from, um, I believe is, is modern Christian intervention coming mm -hmm. into our worldview. I believe that ancestrally, we, we know that they believed in a soul. We can look back at the writings and know that, that, that they believed in a soul. But that soul came from almost a community soul. You know, what they call nowadays, we talk about a folk soul. And this is uh, someplace where all of our ancestors connected, combined with the force that comes from the gods, can create a new soul. Well, we do have the story of... of uh of Odin and his two brothers. Yes. Uh, now that would be the original creation, who create the original from, uh, man and woman. Some material on the edge of the ocean. Yes. Would this, uh, this suggest that the gods themselves actually yeah. have some will or some role in, in the human? Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. I think the gods play an important role in the human species, okay. in the race, at least in ours. And when they talk about that, when we talk about ash and elm, the ash tree and the elm tree that were carved into making the first man and the first woman, I would like to point out that when you look back at the old legend, that is the first European man and European woman. Mm -hmm. We in no way believe that our gods created, again, we don't believe right. that they're the only gods. Right. So they created our people. They started our people. Then there's also um, the, the saga of Heimdall who comes out as Rig, the story of Rig, the song of Rig is what it's referred to as, where Heimdall comes and walks on earth and uh, he, he sleeps with several different people in several different classes and creates the classes of man. Okay. And this can be interpreted a couple different ways. We can look historically and we can see the classes of man from slaves 
to peasants, to free men, to kings and queens. But we can also look at it from a long-term perspective, and many Asatru, um, especially from the uh, more educated and scholarly standpoint, look at this, and they see the evolution of man. Okay. That the gods actually took a part, that there was a need for evolution. And so when there's a need for the evolution, the gods stepped in and did something to force an evolutionary change in us. Now this could be a particularly novel and interesting take on this uh, whole evolution creation yes. debate. Yeah. Because we frequently talk about, what, is it atheistic evolution purely by chance, and uh, so yeah. of the fetus fits, most fit to the environment, and so on. And did God have a role in that? And so this would be an opportunity to offer another possible story. Yes. Is God zoom. God offered yeah. environmental change to force evolutionary. So change. you could say you could have an evolutionary story that's being nudged. Yep. By God's. Yeah, they're not coming in and saying, "Boom, you're higher, more intelligent, you're a better being." They're coming in and saying, "There's a need for you to be better, so we're going to force a change through your environment. Now, we're going to come in, and as a group, we're going to change some things that force you to succeed or fail." Okay. Now. We talked a little bit about the origin of the human. Uh, what what uh, can we expect from uh, the perspective of this religion when we die? Now, when we die, there are a couple of, of, of idealism. There's a few ideas. The two There are two primaries, and I'll say primary. These are probably the two most common, although there are a few others um, that come here and there. Uh, the two primary, one would be Valhalla, uh, which many people know about, the Hall of the Slain. Um, this is something that I do believe in and many Ostrich do. Some don't. Um, now, because it is it later. Is it like a literal conception, or is this a spiritual reality? Or I mean, I would say it's more of a spiritual reality. Yeah. Um, some people would see it as a real conception, but I would see most probably as a spiritual reality. Okay. Um, in this idea that uh, those who are fallen in battle or the greatest of warriors will end up in Valhalla, this uh, this almost paradise of warriors, where uh, they're collecting souls for at one day there will be a great need for Ragnarok, which is like this turning point for humanity, or could be a turning point for humanity, um, and where they will stand and fight and defend both the lands of the gods as well as here, Midgard, where we live, um, from those forces that would try to destroy it. This is, even if you believe in it, which again, I do, um, some people don't, even if you believe in it, this is a very small portion of the community that would make it to a hall. Very tiny, tiny, tiny. So most of us won't go there. The one percenters don't even fit in there. We're talking the one percenters of the one percenters might, okay. get, might get in there. It's small. Uh -huh. um, the rest believe in, and this is very commonly accepted now, this is something that we've learned about recently that is becoming very popular because now we have the historical and archaeological data to back it up to, to understand it better as a worldview. And uh, this would be the concept of the mound, um, like a burial mound. And this is that concept that there is an afterlife beyond this. That afterlife is intermingled with things we don't understand. Okay. Part of that is our ancestors, part of it is the gods, part of it is the nine worlds and Yggdrasil. And, and we just don't understand it because we're not in that world. And our focus is to be good people now and to be living. So we should be focused on being living. But the concept of the mound is that concept of visiting a relative at their home before cell phones, before pagers, before the internet, before computers, if you wanted to know what your cousin was doing for the weekend, you went to his house and you knocked on the door. And hopefully he was there, because that's where he was most of the time. And you talked to him about what was going on. Now, he could go other places if he wanted to. You know, that was his choice. He was a free person. So we look at the dead almost like that. We go to their mound to talk to them, to see them, to be close to them, to seek their knowledge and their understanding or to share with them personal things that were going on. We didn't necessarily know if they were there all the time, but we believed that that was that doorway to them, to that next world. Okay. Where they which existed. which uh, is somewhat mysterious. Which is, yes, yeah, somewhat that mysterious. That other side is mysterious. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, a specific question about that other world. Uh, are there rewards and punishments in that world? Uh, if you live you know, a life of just you like to kick people, for fun, all your life, and you die, and then you got another guy who's just really awesome. I mean, uh, are they treated differently in the afterlife? Yes, and we believe that you have stature in the next life just like you do in this one, okay. and that your standing in the next world is directly related to your standing in the community in this one. The better person you are here, the better person you will be recognized as there. You get a better start, and so it's kind of like this um, system. Our ancestors based their culture on a true honor system. So you were born at a certain level depending on who your parents were. And you can never fall below that. 
That was based on who your parents were, how good they were, how wealthy they were, how popular they were in the community, how well known for their great deeds, whatnot. Then you can move above that by choice. If you chose to, do better stuff, do greater stuff, and move above that or stay there. But you couldn't move below that. Now your kids could if they really sucked. If you never did anything and then your kids were worse, you can now bring your family name down. But in general, you moved above that. So the goal was to have the highest standing you could because when you moved into the next world, that's the level you moved in at. You moved to the next world at that standing. Are there different halls for people who aren't now, awesome enough to... Yeah. <laughs> absolute awesome now, there are that. some beliefs that there are different worlds. For example, we have Helheim, or Hela's Halls. Uh, this is, Hela is uh, one of the gods, goddesses, to be specific. And she has two halls. She has Muspelheim and Niflheim. And one of the halls is just for the dead. It is a belief very similar to the Greek land of the dead. Um, it was a place where, where people who did nothing of great value, but they weren't terrible people either, they just went to rest. It wasn't a horrible place, it wasn't a terrible place, it was simply a place of rest, of sleep and peace and done. Okay. Pretty boring, but, you know, now our ancestors weren't real big on boring, but it was a calm place. This was for people, again, no, they didn't do anything glorious or great, but, you know, they weren't bad people either. They didn't walk around kicking puppies and you know, killing babies or anything like that. And so, you know, and then there was a bad place. Now, the bad place, again, is that super minority, just like Valhalla. This is the place where the worst of the worst of the worst, and basically murderers of the innocent and oathbreakers. I mean, that, and that, that's right from the sagas and the lore where they talk about that. You know, murderers of the innocent, people who killed innocents without any type of just cause whatsoever, and people who broke their word. So yeah, apparently keeping your word was very important because breaking an oath was uh, like just as bad as as murdering a tiny baby who did nothing to you. Yeah, that's <laughs> so oaths are oaths are serious business. Yes, oaths were very serious business. Okay, I have a couple of other questions I want to ask about. Uh, one uh, one of the ones we definitely want to get out is: Do you have holy scriptures? No, there there is no preset dogma. Um, now, there are certain writings that are very important to most Asa true. Um, obviously, uh, the Havamal, which is a, uh, the Havamal means words of the High One or words of Odin. Um, and this is a set of poetic stanzas that's basically good advice that you should live by. Basically, what it is, is it's a, it's a hundred and forty plus stanzas. I can't remember how many off the top of my head. And it's all just advice. And it's on supposedly. Uh, the words of Odin himself. Yes, supposedly inspired by Odin. And I'll point that out because we actually know the poets wrote them. The Havamal was written by three poets. Okay. It's put together by three different poets. One who started, then one picked up, and then one picked up. Okay. And they put them together into so one So the idea is that there was like a, an inspiration. An inspiration that they believe came from Odin okay. to, to create these, these, these ideas. This is good stuff you should do, okay. that everyone should do just to live a great life and to be safe and to be prosperous and to be glorious and be remembered and, and whatnot. So these are the words. So that, that's pretty important. Again, we don't believe that that is the word of God, but we do believe it came from our ancestors. We believe it was inspired by the gods and that this is really good stuff to know. You know? Um, and then we have a lot of other stuff that we know, although it is mythology and lore, we know it was written by our people specifically to keep a history of our cultural ideas alive. And so these books and these writings become very popular to us. Um, the, the Icelandic sagas are a prime example. The poetic and prose eddas, although we don't actually know the historical value of the prose eddas, because Snorri came right out and said that that was a teaching aid that he used. So we don't know if that was a teaching aid he used based on stuff he actually knew, or if it was just stuff he elaborated on to use it as a teaching aid. Um, okay. But we still look at that, you know, from a cultural aspect as, as a good source material. Um, I'm very fond of, like, Beowulf. Um, Beowulf being the oldest one that we have, the oldest written one, and being one that even most scholars will agree has the least amount of Christian influence on it. Okay. Um, I like to look at that as a really good example of what our people held in high value. The cultural standings, and not only traditions, um, which it does talk a lot about traditions when you read the original translations of Beowulf. A lot of the traditions that people did in the areas and, and the Germanic tribalism and where a lot of these traditions came from, but also the virtues and personal values that they held highest among people. And so those become different um, historical pieces that we can look back on 
to draw not only our worldview from on top of the historical and archaeological data, but on a, on a more spiritual level, it becomes this place where we draw our value system from. Where we say, what is important to hold high, and what is not important to hold high. And you know, how did our ancestors view this? Because we have these books like Beowulf, where we can look back and say, this was obviously very important because they killed him for doing it. So obviously, you know, why did they kill him for doing it? Why, or they didn't kill him for doing it. Or they, you know, they held him in high regard because he did it. You know, it gives you this very detailed look into cultural views. And so whether fictional or not, the cultural importance is still there because it teaches us so much about our true worldview when it comes to values and ideals. Now I have uh, one more question about practice and then a couple questions about a uh, general really big picture or worldwide okay. relation kind of thing. Um, you have a couple of special kinds of uh, rituals that are famous in your religion uh, called bloat and assemble. Uh, could you tell people who have never even heard these two words before at all, just generally, what is a bloat and what is a sumble? All right, so we'll start with a bloat. A bloat um, is a blood sacrifice. The word bloat comes from blotar, which is an old Germanic word, and it simply means blood sacrifice. Um, before people get freaked out because everybody hears that and they automatically get visions in your head of, of well, who knows what they get visions in their head of, something from the X-Files or whatnot. Um, most people have done a blood sacrifice. Um, if you've ever held a large barbecue in your backyard and cooked a bunch of steaks up with your family, you're pretty close to what the bloat is. <laughs> okay. um, although nowadays they tend to be more ritualized and ceremonial. Um, historically we know that they were very ceremonial in some countries and in other countries not. Uh, Germany, for example, it was not very ceremonial, although it was important to the people. The German people weren't overly ceremonial. They were pretty direct and to the point. Um, whereas in Sweden, we also have historical reference to bloat, um, especially around Yule, uh, you know, the midwinter festivals of Christmas, a lot of uh, Christians recognize. Um, it was very ceremonial, because the Swedes were very ceremonial people, and that's just how they like to do things. Um, nowadays, uh, it depends on the kindred, but it can be very ceremonial. It usually starts with uh, some type of uh, annunciation to the gods to draw their attention to the gods and our ancestors, to the fact that we're doing a ceremony specifically for them and we'll be making an offering. Um, usually it involves mead. Um, not many people do blood sacrifices anymore. Um, and that's not because of any type of idealistic kind of... It's a cleanliness matter. The fact is that if you don't do blood sacrifices correctly, um, there are hygiene issues and sterilization issues and there are germ and disease issues that you have to look at now in the world. And you can't just be slaughtering random animals anymore. Okay, you have to be careful what you do. I do know some people who still do blood sacrifices and they're very careful about it. They raise the animal and they make sure that the sacrifice is very humane you know, to the animal and whatnot. And I've even participated in, in one or two of these in the past. But most kindreds, including mine, now instead of a blood sacrifice, we make a sacrifice of either mead or alcohol. It is fairly common, especially stuff that we've made ourselves. So there's been a lot of effort put into it. My kindred, for example, brews our own mead. You know, it can take anywhere from a year and a half to two years to get a good bottle of mead. So that's two years worth of work into a bottle that we're now going to sacrifice to the gods. You know, and that so that's not that different than raising an animal. So the so the, blo so the bloat is uh, is quite god, god. It tends to be very god oriented. Okay. Um, uh, although there there is indication to the land whites and to the ancestors as well, okay. it is much more god focused. Okay. Um, it's also a little more rare. It's not something you do all the time. So would you say the bloat is a little bit more of a major event than a sumble? Yes, it is a more of a major event than a sumble. And so what's, what's a sumble like compared to like a bloat? A sumble is more social. Okay. And a sumble is what you see uh, in the stories when you read the heroic legends. Uh, Beowulf, again, a prime example. When the king's in the mead hall drinking and um, everybody is standing randomly making toasts and saying great praises. and what, That's basically what a sumble is. Um, nowadays we use the sumble in a ceremonial practice where we call upon both whatever gods we call upon during bloat, or maybe we didn't have bloat that day and we're just calling on a specific god. And But then now the focus becomes to our ancestors and to the whites around us, and it becomes more of a social, it is a means of linking all of us together um, in front of our ancestors and the gods. And uh, it usually involves three rounds of either mead or beer or another alcohol of choice. 
Um, and uh, the most common, although this is not required to follow this pattern, the most commonly used pattern that I found with an ASA true is host, ghost, and boast. The first round would be to the gods or ancestors that you're celebrating at that particular time, um, or land whites, it usually involves around a god of that season. Um, or your area or whatnot. The second round is ghosts, so those are always to your ancestors, um, whether you know who they are or not. And then boast is like an open round. You sing a song, say a poem, talk about something awesome that you did, and I would like to push people that our ancestors believe it was a good thing to boast about great things you did. So this is your chance to boast about great things that you did. So would you say that would you say that the that the sumble is a little bit more of a casual atmosphere, whereas the bloat seems to have a little bit more of a of a kind of a serious I would. Um, the blow does tend to be a little more serious, and the symbol does tend to be a little more casual. Um, but I, I try to remind people, too, not to let the casualness of a bloat go too far, because I believe that the symbol is actually more of a spiritual connection for our people to our ancestors and the gods than the bloat is. Although the bloat is specifically a sacrifice, usually to one god or a couple gods, and the symbol is more of a linking between us and our ancestors, there's more at risk in the symbol. Plus, we know that more of our ancestors did symbol more often. We know it was more commonly, it was the most commonly practiced. It was commonly practiced by almost all European cultures, uh, even the non-Germanic ones. Many of the non-Germanic ones practiced it. Um, it was a part of a regular life. Um, from a spiritual aspect, symbols were held on a regular basis. It's probably once a month, maybe even more in some places. Um, and so this becomes a more common type of ritual that you can do, kind of a bonding ritual that connects both all of your people within your tribe or your group or your kindred or community, whatever, um, with your ancestors and the God. That is your big link up. Whereas the bloat tends to be a specific sacrifice for a specific purpose. And so although it is more ritualized and a little more, a little less um, casual, um, it's more focused on a singular thing. Okay. And uh, so I think from a spiritual aspect, you have more to lose by being a jerk during supple mm. than you do by being a jerk during blow. <laughs> Although, I would recommend don't be a jerk at all and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a couple, I have just two more questions for you. Okay. Uh, here's one. So, what role do you think Asa True and its uh, members can uh, play in working towards solving some of the world's more large-scale problems? Do you think the that this community can play a role in, in I think it being can. an official contrib contrib contribution to solving some major problems. I think it can, but not in the way a lot of people like to look at it. A lot of people look at large world problems and large scale problems and say, you know, what can our community do to help stop these? I think the one thing that Austru offers to solve some of these large scale world problems is to remind people that the best way to solve large scale world problems is to remove everybody from them. If people focused on their their kindred, their their inner guard, their inner yard, take your time and focus on making that a good place. And then when that's a good place, then if you think other things need focus, now you can expand to your outer yard. Oh, and so, make right. that so a good you're place. moving toward the outside from the inside. From the inside out, okay. and not too far. Okay. Your max being your region. You don't even have to look at your country. You know, and this is a and tribal kind of. This is a tribal mentality. Yeah. But that tribal mentality, I think, has that exists within Asatru offers these big world problems. If everybody, if every Asatru community takes the time, no matter how big your community is, and no matter where you live in the world, if every Asatru community takes the time to make their region, folk, and soil a better place to live in, then you don't have to worry so much about these big international and national and world so, issues. So work on yourself. You have yeah. work to do. Make yourself better. Make yourself you better. make yourself better, people benefit around they, you. They do. And if and once everybody, everybody benefits around them. And I think that that is a worldview that everybody can learn from. If everybody takes the time to make themselves more self-sufficient, to take care of their own regional, local, community, family areas, and, and never you never need to go outside your region. I mean, realistically, and if everybody takes that viewpoint, and everybody takes that tribalistic mentality to a degree to some point to say, my focus is not going to be on what the world is doing. What can I do to make my little piece of it a better place to live in? And everybody takes that tribalistic mentality. Many of the larger scale world issues would simply solve themselves because they wouldn't really be issues anymore. The national economy wouldn't be issue an issue if every state could financially support itself. 
If every state said we're going to be independent and we're going to take care of ourselves and we're going to stop relying on Big Brother, then when the national government wanted to step in and do something that wasn't okay, the state could stop it because the state would have the self-sufficiency to say, I'm not worrying about your issues. You're required to take care of that. I'm not going to solve it for so you. So you're looking at it from the country kind of being built up more from the community level to the state level more and working That's right right. up to the top rather than the top running everything from the top. That's down. right. Okay. And uh, now here's, here's my last question for you before we wrap up today. Um, do you have any advice for uh, young people who are in uh, Aosa True and interested in Aosa True or other ethnic uh, kinds of or tribal kinds of, uh, of faiths? Do you have any advice for the young people? Yeah, I think um, if you're in any type of tribalistic or ethnic uh, faith, which I think everyone should be, no matter who you are, uh, my personal belief is you should seek your own culture and your own ethnicity and you should find your connection to your ancestors that way. Um, but I think uh, if you take your time to learn, learn from your elders, learn from your past, learn from your history, and then apply it to your life. Um, try not to be so focused on the big picture. A lot of times when you're new to ethnic or cultural beliefs, your focus is on the, you want to be that grand hero immediately. You want the biggest god. You want the coolest position. You want to be recognized by the greatest people. You want to do the biggest things as fast as possible. Slow you down. Pull yourself back a little bit. Focus on educating yourself. Who were your ancestors? What did your culture really believe? How do I function as a positive member of it? And then build from there, and you'll build up to those grand deeds, and people will know you and remember you, and you will accomplish that. Even if nobody in the overall community knows who you are, the people closest to you will recognize that difference in you, and, and you'll feel it, and they'll feel it, and you'll understand what your ancestors were trying to do. Well, thanks a lot, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mythology Corner for having us here today. Uh, I'm Dr. Michael Valley from Scottsdale Community College here with Vincent Enlund, and we hope to see you in the future with uh, more discussions. Thank you to Excellent. Mythology Corner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Enlund.